Welcome to the Still Life Podcast, a series of 21 topics, with each episode exploring the practical nature of the spiritual experience. With time-tested insights from psychotherapy, evolutionary biology, and meditation, from ex-animator and stillness coach, Jim. Because I view Jim George as a trainer for the soul. There's no better animation artist, drawer than Jim. He is a friend, he is a mentor, incredible advisor. There's no one who's more important to me in my life. The most interesting, most intelligent person I've ever met. He truly is somebody who wants nothing from you and everything for you. My name is Henry, and I'm a former client of Jim's. And the work we've done together over the past eight years has changed my life. We're now on a mission to share these insights with you and to draw some pretty interesting conclusions on how to live a still life. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Still Life Podcast. My name is Henry. I am a co-host for today, and this episode is episode two of a 21-part series, and today's topic is on identity. We start with what does it even mean and defining it, really. Jim does that thing where he like pulls out all of the Latin words and sounds really clever and helps you to really understand what does it even mean when we say identity and how can we identify with things? And what's really interesting is we talk about how you can identify with multiple things at once and hold multiple identities within you. And that's just a really interesting concept that was subconscious for me for a long time until I started bringing it up through stillness, evaluating it and realizing, wow, I'm identifying with all of these things. And then being able to understand, huh, do I want to identify with this group or this whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Really cool bloody stuff. But the meat of our conversation goes right into how do you be authentically yourself? And this is something that I think is really overlooked where a lot of the time our suffering internally is because we're pretending to be somebody that we're not. And it's really difficult, at least for me, it's been really difficult to be authentic and true to what it is I am on the inside and identify with me with whatever it is that animates this biomechanical meat suit that I call Henry, right? So that's the bit that I get the most out of personally. I hope that you share the same sentiment, but I'm not going to make up your mind for you. Anyway, sit back and enjoy. As a former client of yours, Mm -hmm. I picked up on a few of your habits. And on your desk, you have the Oxford Dictionary of English Etymology. (laughs) You know, just some light reading. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a page turner. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you could help break down our topic for today in terms of breaking down the word identity into its constituent parts to help set the scene and establish a foundation for us to build off of. Well, first of all, thanks for even caring about etymology the origin of words because it's a fascinating history and there's a lot of insight that comes from doing that as opposed to studying entomology which is the study of bugs (laughs) Um, yeah identity derives from the old Latin identitas identitas which itself derives from an even older root, idem. Idem, which means same, the same. So you can almost hear identical in identitas, the same, which is very different from what we think of as identity, because identity was influenced by the same Latin, essentitas, essentitas. You can almost hear essence in that word, the essence of something. So we talk about our identity as our essence, the, the core of who we are, and we then identify with that. We are the same as that core. So the exploration of our core becomes really critical. 
for our true sense of identity. Hmm. So it seems as if we can identify with a lot of different things. Yes. Right? Feel the same as. Yeah. Yes. So I can feel the same as uh, a male, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I can feel the same as somebody who wears glasses. Yes. Right? There's a lot of things that I can identify with. Yes. And I was wondering if you could sort of explain how the scope of identity can change and also the types of things that we can identify with can change. And how is it that I can identify with multiple things at once and basically hold multiple identities at different scopes that are completely different to each other? Mm -hmm. It feels as if it's, it's, cramming a lot of stuff into one mind, you know, yeah. it's trying to fit 10 pounds of potatoes into a five pound bag. Yeah. How can, how can that be? How can I really be, how can I have that many cores as such? How can I have that many essences? Yeah. What is identity in the way that we humans identify with things in the, the sort of cultural understanding of the word as sure. it stands. Well, this is what I really appreciate about how you explore, how you ask these questions, because there's a big difference between discovering some common characteristics and what your core essence is. You are indeed a human male But is human male the core of who and what you are? You can identify, that is, have some of the same characteristics as someone who wears glasses. But is that your core? I hope not. Because if you take those glasses off, you would be lost. (laughs) So what I'm suggesting is, in a culture that tends to be very surface-oriented, a culture that looks at what is presented at the most superficial level and really gets wrapped up in that, it can become tricky determining what your true identity is. So it's important that you do what you just started doing, which is let's explore What's the core, that is, our identity, our essence, rather than what do we have that is the same as a lot of other people? Hmm. They're they're close, but no cigar. So you greet new clients with the same two questions largely (laughs) all the time. Sure which is, who are you really? Yes. And what do you love? Mm -hmm. Now, that first question, who are you really, Mm -hmm. seems to have a tie to identity. Yes. And the way that I would have answered that the first time that you asked would have been to tell you a story. Yes. To basically go into a narrative. Yes. Now, we can identify quite closely with that narrative. Mm-hmm. And I think from the Western philosophical perspective, we really have built a lot of our patterns around that. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could expand upon that a little bit, where if I were to answer the question of who I am with a story, how accurate is that story to who I really am? And how does identity in the way that we play around with it these days sort of fit into it all? Yeah. I'd like to suggest that there is a vast difference between who you are and your story. I'd like to suggest that who you are runs deep. Deeper than words will take us. I'd like to suggest your story can be changed with just a few keystrokes and that your narrative, by definition, is an editorial process 
And I would suggest that very few people can tell the same story about themselves repeatedly without changing it, editing it, post hoc. Because a story, by definition, is not what it's representing. There are very important things that are left out depending on the values of the narrator. There are very interesting things that may be added to that story that may or may not have actually happened. So when somebody says, what's your story? They're saying, give me a piece of fiction. And that's okay. But you have to be very careful if you're assuming that your story is your true identity. The idea that a narrative can be substituted for who you really are is just a convenient artifact to how we interact with our fellow human beings. It's pretty tough to ask someone, who are you, and expect a pat answer, like, I'm an architect. What we really mean when we say, who are you, is, are you worth knowing or not? According to my criteria, by the way, I don't care about yours. So who are you? I'm at a party, and I'm scanning the room looking for who's important, and you tell me a narrative, and I go, ah. My little Bambi ears perk up, or they don't. It's funny, but I've been told that in Argentina, they don't ask, what do you do? They ask, what do you love to do? And there's a huge difference there because who, what do you love to do really gets closer to who you really are. So who are you really is an ongoing, almost unanswerable question in that it's never a complete answer. It's a process, just like living but it will cause you to get deeper and deeper and deeper into this essence. And I hope I haven't wandered too far off the... No, not at all. Okay, good. When I asked you multiple times, all right, Jim, what's your story? You always sort of replied, well, my story doesn't matter at all. Not at all. What matters is you. Yes. And... I doubt that's very fun at parties, but I don't think that you go to many of those. No, (laughs) no. But... My question back to you is that you've had a lot longer to continue to inquire and you've also been using this introspective tool of stillness to really dig in to who it is and what it is that we really are underneath this narrative, Mm -hmm. underneath this story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So who are you? So if we're going for ascentitas, the essence, here's why I'm not much fun at parties. I am pure, open awareness. That awareness has the ability to focus or expand at will. That awareness gets lost in whatever the object of the awareness may be, gets lost in the experience, the content of awareness, but it's not the content of awareness. And when I get quiet enough, that awareness, like an old friend, is revealed to me, wordlessly, thoughtlessly, in the most gentle, the most loving way possible. And that's probably about the time the person takes a hard about face and goes over to the bar. (laughs) Well, I beg to differ because as soon as you started saying that, you put me into a tractor (laughs) beam and uh, you know I was stone still. So I don't That's because you're who you are. That's why I love you. 
And I don't mind letting people know that. <laughs> wow. Well, let's get you to a couple of parties soon because I really want to see how people react oh, to that. Oh, you don't want to watch. It's <laughs> ugly. So I just wanted to pause for a second to just say, what? I asked this man, who are you? And he answers, uh, well, essentially at the core of it, I am pure open awareness, right? And I really don't think this is coming from just a cerebral place. I really don't think that's just something he's thought up. I think it's something that he genuinely experiences every day when he quiets his mind and gets really still, right? Because he mentions that the awareness just gets caught in the object of awareness, right? He gets caught up in being Jim a lot of the time, but has so many experiences from building this practice where he just untethers that awareness from whatever it is that it's aware of that he then says, actually, I'm identifying with the pure, open, loving awareness itself. And that to me is just the coolest bloody thing ever. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Bye-bye. On to the next bit. So you were talking about at the core of you mm -hmm. is pure open awareness. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that to be the case at the core of everybody, it's just whether they want to observe that and whether they want to really connect with that. Sure. I think in just a layer above that is what that awareness is sort of channeling through us. Mm -hmm. And we spoke about this in our talk about meaning, where mm -hmm. we have this intrinsic sort of sense of what's important to us. Yeah. And then we have an extrinsic sort of societally imposed uh, sense of what's important to the group. Yeah. So I think that <clears throat> there's this trite saying that has so much depth to it, but it's been sort of so overused that it doesn't feel as if it can really hold that much truth. Mm -hmm. And that's like, just be yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that anybody who is the true authentic self has this sort of magnetic quality to them. It's true. And so just above that core, that essence of just pure open awareness, mm -hmm. I believe there to be sort of like a layer and there's no boundary here. So I, I really don't think that you can get too specific about it and creating a model around it is just going to be absolute false. But for just the purpose of this conversation, it feels as if there's something that is fueling in an, an intrinsic feeling of who I am and what yeah. I am yes. and what's what's important to me. And I think this is sort of steering towards the question of how do you know if you are being your true authentic self mm -hmm. and how can you sort of adjust your behavior to align more appropriately with that true self, okay. knowing that if you are if you are continuing to behave in alignment with that, mm -hmm. that you have this I don't want to say true because I've used that word like seven times in the past two sentences, <laughs> but let's go ahead and do it because sure. I'm not getting anything else, sure. but I'm being true to me. Yeah. So let's pretend that we've got some kind of a test for that. So when there's no one around, are you still behaving the same way? Put another way. Are you ever afraid of being found out? That is, ooh, if someone really knew who I am, they wouldn't like me. I think that was definitely the case in my past, but I think that the work that we've done together has helped me to be able to lean far more deeply into who and what it is that I am. Yeah, I don't think that. I know that. I've watched you. I've watched you change. I can't thank you enough because that's very rewarding. It is heroic in my view because it is not easy to buck the cultural current of status-driven compliancy to these extrinsic values. But I promise you there's nothing more attractive than someone who's comfortable in their own skin. This 
unique life that you're living, that I'm living, that everyone's living, it's an experience for that awareness, and it is like no one else. It's an adventure to discover what that is, what that's supposed to be. But we've got all these pressures that make it more and more challenging. That's okay. You get still, and a lot of those pressures just fall away. Yeah, I really can't thank you enough because the ability to get quiet, to get still, and feel the relief from those pressures Mm -hmm. has resulted in more comfortability with my essence, my yeah. core, who, who, yes. who it is that I actually am, yeah. instead of abiding by a bunch of cultural habits that mm-hmm. are sort of imposed upon us yeah. to, to do certain things at certain times in certain ways. Yeah. Now, in fairness, as you get still, you may discover that those boundaries, those impositions are useful to you. I'm not saying every time you get still, you just punt and start driving through red lights. (laughs) I am saying, though, that now there's an alignment between your true identity and the way you're behaving. That's all. Yeah, again, I just can't thank you for the the work that we've done together because the result is is this growing mass of evidence that who I say I am my behavior Mm -hmm. and who I say I am are aligned. Yes. And that, that gives you just, uh, that's confidence. That's confidence in with yourself. Will you do me a favor? Say that again so you can hear it, so that everybody can hear that. Being authentic to yourself gives you a sense of what? Confidence. Yes. Okay. Because if you are not being true to your core, there's always a black hole in there. An empty, gaping black hole that says, I'm not being true to myself. I must feel a sense of lack. I'm not enough. I have to behave in a way that someone else will perceive is enough. Again, your center is way out there somewhere, and you'll never catch it. Who is Bobo the Dancing Bear? Oh, boy. Well, during the course of my practice with people, I like to try to help people visualize some of these concepts in a way that's not so heavy and so, you know, dry. So I consider this sort of persona that most of us have been trained to be, which is different based on how we've been raised, we're we're trained that if we do certain things, people like us. And at an even earlier stage, if we do certain things, we behave a certain way, our parents will tend to give us more of what it is we need. Love, nurturing, even sustenance. And if we behave in other ways, they won't. And then as we get older, we start learning that other people, our friends, people we know, our more distant relatives, are kind of the same way. If we behave a certain way, we get more of what we want, what we think we need. And if we behave differently, well, then we don't get what we want, what we need. So very quickly, we learn to adopt this behavioral persona in order to get more of what we want. I call that persona being Bobo, the dancing bear. And you imagine this dancing bear in tap shoes with the music playing, and Bobo is dancing as hard as Bobo can to get people to like him. Unfortunately, you are not Bobo. So the best you can hope for in being Bobo the Dancing Bear is someone is going to wind up liking and ultimately loving Bobo the Dancing Bear. If you're interested in learning more about Bobo the Dancing Bear, I've dropped in a link in the description. 
to a recording that Jim made for our app a while back, which is actually a reflection on Bobo himself. So it's basically a short recording introducing Bobo, lots of sort of sound effects, music, all of that stuff, and Jim composed the whole thing. It's pretty bloody cool in my opinion, and I just wanted to, you know, pop my head in here and see if you're interested. It's down there, it's free, and hopefully you enjoy. And since you're not Bobo the Dancing Bear, they will ultimately discover you've been lying to them. You've been false advertising. You'll discover you will be more and more resentful of them for not seeing through this ruse and liking and loving you for who you really are. There's no way to win. I'd like to suggest that as courageous as you have to be in order to do this, the more you can be true to who and what you really are, you will actually attract the kinds of people who like you and ultimately love you for who and what you truly are. So if I were just to repeat a lot of that back to you. Sure. At least what got through on my end of things. So you let me know if there's some things that sure. I've obviously missed because it's sure. kind of a sieve up here. Um, when we're raised, I think Gabor Mate has a great way of putting this is, in the first sort of few years of our life, we have to sacrifice our own authenticity mm -hmm. for acceptance and survival. Yes. You know, it's, we have to do things to please mom and dad yeah. in order to get that sustenance. Unless we're very lucky and have a mom and dad, as you put it, who really genuinely are just filled with love for who and what we are. My baby's poop doesn't stink. That's a real gift because it's not a fully human thing after about, oh, month and a half of not getting any sleep to still feel that way all the time. It's one of those parenting dirty little secrets. So we kind of learn this habit early mm -hmm. that if we adopt a persona, yeah. if we identify with sort of something that's not necessarily our core, yes. that's rewarded yes. uh, for certain actions, then we can continue to basically reinforce that over time. Mm -hmm. And if that's taken to an extreme, you can basically create a whole sort of n another aspect of self that yes. isn't necessarily you. Yes, And if you continue to behave this way, it's falsely advertising what you are at the core mm -hmm. and you will both smell the rot as will somebody else yes. because of the false advertising, because of the misrepresentation of who it is and what you are truly deep down. Yeah. And I think that we can see this with a lot of people as they, as they age because they, I think there's a natural progression with stages of life to stop giving as much of a... Of Go ahead a, and say it. Yeah, I'm as sure much you. of a shit yeah. as anybody else because, you know, <laughs> uh, older people don't really care about their attire as much, et cetera, et sure. cetera. Why? Because uh, maybe they're not at the stage of trying to uh, promote themselves for reproductive success. Good. So they're not trying to showboat a Good. lot of Good. different aspects of sure. potentially who they are. Does that sound so terrible? Or does it sound like immense liberation? <laughs> Probably liberation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So pay attention as you start thinking, oh my God, I, d I don't want to get old. I don't want to get free, is what you're saying. Hmm. I like that. Okay, so expanding upon that a little bit more, Bobo the Dancing Bear is a phenomenon that happens when you create this persona and people fall in love with the persona rather than you. Yes. And then feel hard done by when you either reveal who it is that you really are yes. or you don't feel as if they recognize who it is that you really are yeah. underneath all of that. Because yeah, eventually it's going to come out one way or the other because it's not who you are. The and you closer the they eyes. get, the more they're going to realize it's not you. It, you can't continue to behave in a way that isn't authentic. The more people get to know you, the more who you really are is going to be revealed. 
Save yourself some time and heartache. Be yourself now. And I think you mentioned a really interesting point where it's like, it's not just going to attract people, but it's going to repel people. Yes. And I think that that's really important to, to drive home because you're yes. repelling people <laughs> that don't like you. <laughs> that don't like you. Now, this is why I love you. That's, that's the point of this that people don't hear. They hear me say, just be yourself. Don't bathe. Don't, you know, don't wipe. You know, what, whatever it is you're, you're not going to do because I don't feel like it. That's not what I'm saying at all. But if you are authentically who you are and someone doesn't like you, thank them. They're saving you all kinds of time, months, years of heartache because they're looking for someone other than you. And that's great. It's a big world out there. You want someone who likes you. Or, in an even more interesting relationship, you want someone who pushes against you. Someone that can create some friction so you can both learn and grow and help them learn and grow. You're not just looking for clones of yourself. But you can't do this if you're not authentically who you are. And remember, I'm not saying that extrinsic values don't apply to you. They do. The degree to which we need to get along with people is highly subjective. Doesn't really ever drop to zero. But if it's too close to 100%, you're not authentic anymore. Remember, we keep getting back to this thing of balance. How do you know if you're being yourself? Is that an energetic sense? And how can you practice reinforcing the, the authenticity? So again, are you afraid of being found out? If you're being yourself authentically, you almost never have to think twice about what you're doing. And by that, I don't mean that you're being rude to people and you're not, you're not observing social conventions. I just mean, what are people going to think is a nagging question that keeps you at least one thought away from who, in fact, you are. You're always in the attic above a party when you're thinking, how should I behave? Because behavior is operating at an enormously faster rate than your conscious mind can keep up. So you'll notice that there are people who seem very distracted and very inauthentic because they're in their heads trying to be someone different. How would Kevin do this? How would Suzette do this? You're lost to begin with. What takes real courage is to recognize this unique gift. You and everyone on this planet are unique. That means at some level you have to pull on your big boy pants and be who you are. And it's very scary because there's tremendous pressure on us to be like everybody else in an absolutely just-do-it kind of be-your-own-person way. Well, those two don't go together. Trying to be like everybody else means you're not yourself. There's something powerful in the, the owning of who you truly are. Now, I'm not saying that that comes to you on your 12th birthday in a box. I'm saying you're developing this constantly. What I've pulled from that, there's two sort of tactical questions that if you catch yourself asking, mm -hmm. could be yellow to red flags that yes. you aren't necessarily being yourself. Yes. Which is, how should I be behaving here? Yeah. And what are they going to think? Yeah. Because that tends to be a step away from what it is that's actually going on within you. Mm -hmm. You're sort of, a, a, it's a second degree type of behavior yes. rather than just primarily yes. acting from that space within yourself that yes. is 
authentic yes. to a degree. And you mentioned that taking ownership in yourself is an ongoing process because <laughs> you, your core, your, in your case, open, pure, loving awareness, it's a dynamic thing. It isn't a finite aspect that you can sort of draw a box around. That's exactly right. And so if that's continuously developing and continuously moving, it's, it's an ongoing process to get to know that and identity isn't necessarily static. Mm -hmm. And so if you're training yourself to be more authentic to who it is that you really are, yeah. why might that be scary? You mentioned that it might be scary at first to do that. Sure. What's going on from a sort of evolutionary perspective that might spark fear within ourselves? Remember our evolutionary roots in status. So let's see if we can get a clearer picture on why status matters. <laughs> All right? So try to remember that our early ancestors weren't all that impressive. They weren't very big. They weren't very fast. They certainly weren't very powerful. They were mostly snacks for larger, faster, more powerful predators. And it wasn't until we started forming larger, larger groups of us Homo sapiens that we even had a chance to survive, let alone thrive and go from the lower third of the food chain to the apex species on Earth. But what that meant was, if that group, whatever the group was, decided that you weren't worth having in it and threw you out of that group, well, that was tantamount to a death sentence. <laughs> so, does that make it easier to understand why status matters, that's deeply embedded in our neurology, in our limbic system. We know that at a very deep level. So don't feel bad about thinking that status is important. It is. It's just that today that status is much more psychological than physiological. We're kind of clumsy, we're small, we're not very big, we're not very fast, we're not very powerful. We're mostly snacks for larger, faster, more powerful predators. And if we don't do something about that, we're going to be extinct as a species. And Homo sapiens did something about that, something remarkable. They started working together. We've talked about this. A, a, an adult male lion can take an adult male Homo sapiens like that, be home for lunch. An adult male lion can take two or three adult male Homo sapiens, take a little bit more strategy, a little more work, but they'll be home by, by dinner. An adult male lion cannot take 150 adult homo sapiens with the single focused, coherent intention to kill it. And that takes homo sapiens from somewhere in the lower third of the food chain to the apex of that food chain, evolutionarily speaking. But that consigns those same Homo sapiens to a life of needing to pay attention to their status in that group. Mm. Because if they are ever thrown out of that group, if the group doesn't like them enough to throw them out, that's a death sentence. That's deeply embedded in our limbic system. So these societal pressures are very real. They're very powerful, but it's important to understand when they get out of balance and out of whack. The fact that I don't have the right shoes does not mean I'm going to die. 
But that's what my limbic system feels because it takes a lot longer to evolve physiologically than our environment takes to change. So these pressures come down to one single question. What if nobody likes me? And the feeling state is, I'm going to die. Good. Take a breath. Hold it. Let that breath go. Am I, in fact, going to die? Wow. I seem to be still here. The world seems to be going in its orbit. Okay. But I've gone from being terrified to now being mildly concerned. I'm still concerned because there's a very real possibility if I continue to be who I really am, nobody's going to like me. But if you get quiet enough, you're going to understand that who you really are underneath all this emotional, mental, physical, and even spiritual noise and distraction isn't these weak behaviors that you've developed as a compensatory strategy against fear of not being enough. Hmm. You're not trying to fill up an empty bucket that has holes in it. You're back to realizing who you really are, and who you really are is crucial. If we look from an evolutionary perspective, Mm -hmm. status and group acceptance is tied to survival. Yep. Because if we don't have acceptance from the tribe, we're out of the tribe, and the one adult Mm -hmm. homo sapien versus one adult lion. Hand the lion a toothpick because it's over. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The ability to be accepted by the group is very deeply wired within us. Yes. And And the question often, I don't mean to cut you off, what group? We hardly ever think about that. There isn't one group. Well, I guess it depends which group you want to most closely identify with. Right now, based on Bobo the Dancing Bear telling you, you better do this. You may be in the wrong group. Mm. So this ability to identify with groups and identify with different sort of traits, yes. largely in an abstract way, yes. has an incredible benefit to being able to get along with that group. Yes. But in today's day and age, with this mismatch between our real primal neurology yes. and the society around us, yes. if we identify with something that might be rejected by a certain group, Mm -hmm. we have this internal feeling of, oh my God, I'm going to die. Yes. When in reality, that's not the case. Just because you're wearing a different color pair of shoes than Mm -hmm. the group is and they Mm -hmm. say, okay, yeah, we're not having this, Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you're going to die. And it might actually mean if you don't like those shoes, it would be better wearing a different pair of shoes anyway if it's more aligned with who and what you truly are at the core of it. Or if your group values the fact that you wear one pair of shoes over another, you may want to consider the validity of that group in your life. (laughs) I'm not kidding. I know you're not. It's just funny. But you have to get past that limbic fear to realize that group might be doing you a favor. I don't want to be a part of a group that's going to throw me to the curb because I don't have the right shoes on. I think that there's a really important point that I just don't want to miss, which is I really do believe that if you understand the reasoning, if you understand the mechanism that is underneath what's making you feel the way that you feel, for example, if you're getting a signal of a negative state of mind from group exclusion, and you start to understand the dynamics that are really at play, and you really think to yourself, is this a group that I want to necessarily identify with? When you have that clarity, when you have the right questions, when you have the right information, it changes the state. It makes the thing so much more easy to approach. You understand that like, wow, I'm suffering, but do I really need to be? And that to me is freedom. And that's why I think that this practice 
And these frameworks and these discussions are so important because the practice helps you to stop the narrative and just to feel the state underneath. And then if you have the right questions to ask about that state, you can potentially throw it off balance and reorient your life so that you can actually make more active choices with what you want to identify with and who you ultimately want to become. That to me is freedom. That to me is internal growth. That to me is the single most important thing that we can dedicate our time to. Anyway, I just wanted to pause there because I think Jim's just done such a brilliant job articulating a very complex mechanism, but simplifying it to a way that makes so much sense that we can actually extract utility, apply it to our lives. And if you're anything like me, start to really question a lot of these larger aspects, these larger groups that I had been putting my self-worth into and really understanding, is this a place that I want to be doing that to? So anyway, it was just a little bit of a diatribe, but I, I just thought that it was so important to make a note of. I'm going to stop waffling. Let's get on with the show. So we can absolutely identify with certain groups, but we can also identify with certain traits, skills, hobbies, etc., cetera, yes. et cetera. Yes. For example, I can identify with music, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And if, if there are certain traits that I want to emulate, mm -hmm. for example, I'm not comparing myself to Beethoven by any means because sure. I'm a terrible musician. I don't but, know that. But I look at, say, Mozart and I want to emulate a certain skill or talent of his. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you make it very clear within yourself what it is that you want to identify with so that you don't fall into the trap of then turning into potentially Bobo the Dancing Bear, yes. just trying to be that person yes. and losing the authentic sense of self that's underneath all of that. Yeah. First, anytime you try to be someone else, the best you can hope for is to be a second or third rate version of them. Try to remember that. But having said that, the question is, why? Do you want to emulate these traits? What deeper quality in you are these traits resonating with? Why is that valuable to you that you'd want to be able to play or compose, let's say, like Beethoven, as opposed to being able to put a ball through a hoop? Why is that more important to you? Because that's a good indication of something deeper in you because it's resonating with those traits. You don't have to try and be someone. You can say, this is very, very close to my core. I can feel it. And, and it's a good way to keep the distinction because as you begin to practice more and more, we learn by mimicry frequently, and then that mimicry gives way to an authentic voice. So it's okay to mimic what someone else is doing along the way to arriving at your own unique presentation, your own voice. Beethoven, in fact, learned by mimicking other music that he had heard. And I'm not sure about Mozart because it seems like he was just getting it channeled, but it's very important to remember he grew up in a very musical family. Music was everywhere. And I'd like to suggest that if music was everywhere in your life and there was a place in you that was saying, ooh, that music is touching me, I must make that music. You'd be a very different musician right now than you are. But other things touched you. Music still touched you, but other things touched and resonated at a deeper level. That's what you pursued. What I love about the way that you've directed your behavior is that it's going right to the top of the sort of pyramid where it's like if you stop thinking and you attain that state of stillness, you let go of that voice, you let go of that narrative, 
and you start to feel this intrinsic whatever it is that's bubbling up within you mm -hmm. and then through that you can pursue the the deeper feelings of purpose and yeah. things that you want to build your identity around yeah and so i just again want to thank you for what it is that you've dedicated your life to in terms of dedicating your life to stillness because without knowing it i think that you've really helped hundreds if not thousands of people to get closer to who and what it is that they really are underneath all of that and to find freedom and liberation along the way and i don't think that you will ever know the ripple effect of the work that you're doing i don't think that it's humanly possible to know but we can gain a uh a respect for our inability to grasp that and i hope that you get that feeling when you get still that what you're doing is incredibly important oh, although you. it might not come in the gratitude that is sort of directly proportional in a way that we can recognize oh thank you i don't have any choice i mean whatever it is i'm doing um like some weird kinetic doll, I've banged my head into so many different places on the wall till I found the gym-shaped hole and <laughs> fit into it. I'm just suggesting everyone else has that same gift. And it doesn't look like anyone else. You are cutting a U-shaped, you as in you, the individual, shaped hole in this universe. And you're fitting it perfectly. The culture wants you to fit into a round hole or a square hole. And you're going to have to either rattle around in that box or you're going to have to cut off a couple of limbs in order to fit in there, and it's a bad fit. Be patient, trusting, and cultivate loving relationships with people who genuinely love you and let yourself evolve into who you're meant to be. It's an ongoing process. Who are some people that you think are their authentic selves mm -hmm. that you can feel or that you've just, that you have a respect for in that regard? That's a tough question for a number of reasons. Number one, you can't really tell too early on in their lives. So most of them would have to be at least well on their way to having lived their lives to know if they're being authentic or not. And second, most of the people that I know who are really being authentic don't care if anybody knows who they are. So you're not going to find them on Instagram. You're not going to find them on YouTube. They're busy doing what they're doing quietly because it's, it's an internal motivation. But given that, there are some people that are just so obvious to me. Most of them won't mean anything to anybody today, unfortunately. But I have to start with my own father. I, I had no idea what an amazing, benevolent, ascendant, smiling guru this guy was because he never appeared to be that. He was just living his life. And I, I just learned so much from him. And he was, in my view, the best father in the universe for me, for someone else, maybe not. And the opportunity to continue working with him, he's long physically dead, but his energy is cooking. He's right here talking to you. I think he was, if not the most, certainly one of the most authentic people I've ever met because he proved it again and again and again, going against the current of he could have made so much more money doing X. He could have been so much more popular doing why he just stayed true to his core and his values were just all you had to do is watch his behavior and he never talked about it i 
I respect him more now than I ever did earlier. I don't know if anybody knows who Jane Goodall is, the primatologist. Well, she's still cooking too. She is cooking on eight burners. She she would run a 20-year-old into the ground, but it is so authentic to who she is. And her energy, her values, her, her core essence is what's filling her with energy. She's tapped into something far deeper, more fundamental than just food and water. I believe that Fred Rogers was one of those guys. Mr. Rogers. Sounds funny because people don't really understand what it was he was even working with. But I believe he was utterly authentic to who and what he is. What were some cues that led you to believe that? Can you imagine what it would take for you to maintain a body weight of 143 pounds every day of your adult life. What would that require? Discipline. Yeah, mania. He maintained that body weight because I has one letter, love has four letters, and you has three letters. He wasn't going to allow any human frailty or weakness to slip past this innate reminder 24-7 who he is. Well, I try and maintain a body weight of 169 pounds. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we won't get into that. No, we won't. Yeah. We don't need to save that for next episode. Eh? Yeah. Well, all I'm suggesting is that's how important that was to him And here's a guy who was bullied, who had every right to grow up to be an abusive guy. He took it the other way. He transformed it into genuine capital L love, especially this amazing 143 love of the child in all of us. And I used to watch as different people, hosts of evening talk shows, night, late night talk shows, used to try, to try to ambush him because he was such an easy target. And they'd have him come on and they'd set him up, they'd get him all set up on camera and then start going after him because this guy was just, there's something wrong here. I don't, I don't know, but he's just too nice. And there wasn't one who wasn't utterly transformed and reduced to a seven-year-old child by the sheer force of the authentic Fred Rogers. And it went right up till the day he died. So he's one that I think was authentic. Others may disagree with me, but you asked what I thought. Yeah, and it seems as if Authentic to who and what it is that was really in him. Yeah, and that's another big piece that you touch on. Thank you for that. It isn't just I'm busy, blah, 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 blah. It's something's coming up in me that's bigger than I am as an individual, an isolated individual. And you can call that love. That's right. I frequently do. (laughs) So... Your father, Jane Goodall, Fred Rogers, these are all people that feel to be authentically themselves, are attracting and repelling the right people because of that authenticity. Yes. And from that, gain a, just a a level of respect and almost sort of intrinsic relief that those Mm -hmm. types of people exist. Yeah. Instead of the the bobos of the world that are continuously dancing to impress the crowd and impress the group. Yeah. Well, Jim, I can't thank you again enough for helping, I'll speak for myself, uh, helping me to tap into what it is that is underneath all of that noise. Mm. Because I think that that ability to then lean 
more bravely into who and what it is that I, that I am yeah. and polish yeah. that so that I can become even more mm-hmm. as, as I grow up and go through these stages of life. Yeah. It's the, the greatest gift I've ever been given. Mm. And I have completely stolen those words from you. <laughs> so thank you also for uh, all of the wisdom that you impart. Uh, it helps me to sound a lot cleverer in conversation. And that right there is uh, a signifier that I'm caring about what other people think <laughs> and not necessarily being my true self. <laughs> um, but thank you for all of that because I think that these tools are really important uh, at least they've been very important for me yeah. to help to build towards my life well lived. That's absolutely true to who I am and to feel a lasting sensation of satisfaction yeah. as I identify with me. So as always, thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. Now, if you're looking to build a stillness practice yourself, we have a lot of free resources, audios that Jim's recorded, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see those in our show notes below. Along with that, there are also online courses that you can roll in if you want to learn more from Jim. We also have uh, Obsidian Mind Maps. You can see a couple of them popping up here on the screen. Now, these are really cool ways to look at the podcast information and really just get an overview of all of the podcast topics and deepen the information within yourself. And within them, there are more of Jim's recordings. There's also a lot of Jim's artwork. So if you're interested in any more still life stuff, you can find a bunch of links in the description below. Finally, I really hope that you're getting as much out of this as I have. This is why we started this whole thing in the first place, because the combination of Jim and the practice of stillness had really helped to transform our lives here at Still Life. We just wanted to make as much of that available to you. So hopefully you're getting a lot out of it. And please let us know if there's anything that you want to see more of in the future or less of. Anyway, hope you have a lovely day. Bye-bye.